So I'd like to call the uh, March 28, 2013 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. First, approval of the minutes from February 25th, then the Town Planner's Report, followed by the 10 Clinton Road Private Access Way Permit, then we'll be hearing the Robinson Woods II Resource Protection Permit, then the Subdivision Ordinance Overhaul, any public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, then adjournment, and then please note, after our regular meeting, the Planning Board will be holding a special workshop uh, to discuss day camps. So, number one on the agenda, approval of the minutes. Are there any comments, questions, omissions, errors? Or would anyone like to make a motion? Well, if we accept the minutes as written. <coughs> motion by Carol Ann. Any second? Yep, second. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Peter? All those in oh, favor? I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all those opposed? And the minutes passed unanimously. Uh, next is the town planner's report. Um, I don't have a lot of new things to report. Uh, probably the, the most interesting thing is the Conservation Commission is in the middle of its Greenbelt plan, and, and Planning Board member Jordan uh, graciously attended the last meeting of the Conservation Commission. Um, the Greenbelt plan we have right now was adopted in 2001, so it's a little old. It seems to be time to update it. Um, this is the fourth Greenbelt plan the Town of Cape Elizabeth has considered adopting, so there's a long history of Greenbelt planning dating back to 1977. I uh, should, you know, just anyone who's listening, it's a work in progress. Uh, and all of the work of the Conservation Commission, like the Planning Board, has to be done in a public setting. All of their discussions, all of their maps um, are all public on the website, on their meetings, and they have not made any conclusions yet. But we do know that there are people who have concerns, and there will be an opportunity for them to um, add their concerns to the considerations of the Conservation Commission. And just to kind of round that out, the Planning Board does have your training workshop next Tuesday night, and it looks like most of the Conservation Commission will be joining you, so it ought to be an, a great opportunity to share a lot of things. Uh, the building permit notification amendment has been uh, preliminarily drafted by the Ordinance Committee. It's going to the uh, Town Council probably at the April meeting, so the Planning Board can expect to see that at your May workshop. Um, there's also a proposal which will be on your May workshop to look at the definition of the normal high water line in the shoreland zone. And I expect that one to also uh, generate a lot of public interest. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is 10 Clinton Road Private Access Way Permit. Winslow Palesbury is requesting a private access way permit to create a buildable lot located at 10 Clinton Road under section 19-7-9, private access way permit completeness. And this will have a public hearing tonight. I have some comments. Okay. Um, the application will be dressed in the following format. There will be um, an introduction by the town planner followed by a presentation by the applicant. The public is then welcome to comment on, we're doing completeness first. So any comments by the public on completeness. Then the board will determine if the application is complete. If the application is deemed complete, then the public is again welcome to come and ask any questions or comment on the private access way permit application as part of tonight's public hearing. Then the board will discuss uh, the application followed by a vote. And Maureen, would you like to provide us an overview, please? Sure. Um, the property is located at the end of Clinton Road. Clinton Road is a public road, and the, the lot right now has, I think it's about 140 feet of frontage on Clinton Road. So they're dividing the lot in half, and the new lot does not have the required 100 feet of frontage, which is required in the RC district. Um, each lot is about two acres. The whole lot's four acres. And the minimum lot size in the RA district is 20,000 square feet, which is half a lot. Um, there's been issues raised by staff that there's potential for more subdivision of this lot. And um, we should be looking, if that's going to happen, at a, a rational way of providing access to additional lots. I believe the applicant is responding with some proposals to uh, cap the development on the lot at the existing two lots so that we don't have to address potential access in the future. Um, none of those options are 
um, slamming the door completely forever on additional development, but it does go some ways in that direction. Um, there aren't any items that staff is recommending are incomplete, but there is still uh, concerns about the proposed uh, access way, the private access way, and the steepness of that access way. I want to point out that the fire chief is here this evening and is available to answer questions about that driveway and access for emergency vehicles. Thank you. Okay. If the applicant would like to address the board, um, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded, and if you could please state your name for the record. Yes. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions, here this evening with Lee Allen, who is our uh, Vice President of Engineering, with uh, Wynn Pillsbury, who owns the property, and with Jean O'Neill, who is uh, the prospective buyer of the other portion of this uh, private access way, um, and then other members of um, um, families for uh, the Pillsburys. What I'd like to do in the interest of brevity is uh, not to rehash a lot of what we've gone over uh, over the last couple of meetings. Uh, we were here for the sketch plan, as you will remember, and then we were here last month. Uh, taking a look at the overall project, introducing that to you in terms of the overall specifics of the land in which we're dealing with, and uh, then also the private access way. So uh, other than uh, questions and comments, uh, which we'll get to certainly in a moment, I'd like to just uh, reiterate a little bit, call your attention to the plan either in your set or behind you on the wall, and uh, stipulate that what we are looking at here is the private access way that is defined in yellow when you see it on the plan on the wall. This essentially leaves Clinton Street, as Maureen had mentioned. Uh, it comes up the existing hill. I know that uh, most, if not all of us, have been out to the site in conjunction with the site walk earlier this year. Uh, we say it leaves Clinton Street right here. It literally comes up the same area as the existing driveway. The existing driveway does follow the uh, overall outline in yellow is what is proposed for the private access way. It goes all the way up to the existing garage. You can see that there is one house on the property right here. That's the house in which Mr. Pillsbury lives. Uh, this private access way will actually reduce some of the overall impervious surface area that's out there by uh, eliminating this section of the driveway. Uh, we're coming up to a turnout uh, that will be in this particular area. This turnout is going to be on the access way for uh, emergency vehicles or any other vehicles that would actually come up into the other lot, which is right here, allowing them to turn around and then come back down this way. Uh, we certainly welcome Chief Gleason being here this evening. We've met with the chief uh, on site. The chief's been there several times. And uh, we are dealing with a steep slope, to be sure. That steep slope is already obviously there. There's a driveway that already, the existing driveway already goes to the top of that. Uh, it's typically steeper than the uh, regulation would allow in conjunction with the new subdivision, but the planning board does have the ability to address that. Uh, we have done quite a number of engineering studies regarding the emergency vehicles and the links of the fire truck, for instance. Uh, that uh, we'll actually be able to get up this hill. And we have stipulated in the uh, information that you have before you and on the plan that uh, prior to the surface of the private access way actually being paved, that we will uh, run a test out there with the, uh, to the extent that the chief is willing, uh, with the actual vehicle that uh, he had pointed out we needed to measure when we went to the fire station to be able to do that to make sure that that uh, equipment is able to access the driveway from Clinton Street without scraping the back of it uh, or any portion of it on the actual pavement. So that should be no issue. If it becomes an issue, then obviously the grading will be changed relative to the construction that's out there. But to prevent that from actually even happening, we will be out there as a, a reviewing engineer during the course of that construction or in conjunction with that to make sure that the construction is actually completed as the, uh, the designs uh, stipulate that they need to be. So what we're looking at again is a new lot that is coming almost straight up the access way and then to the back of the property. As Maureen had mentioned, this is about a, a four plus acre property surrounded by properties that are uh, generally uh, significantly less or in some cases just a bit less. All of those properties that are on Clinton Lane or Clinton Road are substantially smaller than this one. Uh, there are about uh, half a dozen to eight properties, houses that are actually on Clinton Road. And then there's this property, uh, which again is about eight times the size of the uh, other properties that are out there. From a stormwater perspective, you have all the information as to where the stormwater is going to be going and the management thereof uh, in your plan sets. Typically, as you can see, as you, and we know from being out there that the steep profile brings the stormwater down this way. We have actually, and uh, it's been, um, uh, concur, the uh, reviewing engineer concurs based on the comments that you have from him that uh, this design is actually going to improve the uh, stormwater management in this area. 
uh, before we are actually up to this current date. There's, a, uh, there's no problem necessarily, but there are some overflows of Clinton Street. This design is going to correct that. So in addition to the private access way, we're actually going to have better stormwater management in that particular area. Uh, the, uh, the watershed that you will see that uh, is on one of your plans, the vast majority of the water for this entire property ends up going into the micro watershed and the pond itself. Uh, the pond then outlets, as you can see it on the plan, uh, where it does now. And the existence of the uh, house that will be ostensibly built by, uh, by, Jim, by the uh, proposed buyer of the property uh, will have a negligible, will have zero to a negligible effect on the actual stormwater that is going into the actual pond. Uh, we've already uh, engineered that as well, so there's no issue as far as uh, additional stormwater causing any exacerbation of a negative effect. Um, it's all quite positive, quite the other way around. Excuse so, me. Can I ask you to speak up a little bit? The drum is dry, uh, drowning you out a little bit. Sure. Thank you. No problem. Um, so toward that end, what we, given that uh, we've been through this a uh, couple of times before, what I'd like to do is uh, entertain any questions or comments that the board may have. I'll certainly answer any questions that uh, from the public hearing when we get around to that. And given that, turn that over to the board. Go from there. Uh, next up is Ms. White. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to open tonight's meeting um, to the public for any questions regarding completeness, whether or not everything has been submitted as required for our requirements for the private access way. Would anyone in the public like to speak on completeness? And if, whether or not this application is complete, please come forward. Welcome, and uh, please state your name for the public record. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, members of the board. My name is Jim Cassida. I'm with Normando Associates, and I have been uh, retained by <clears throat> the neighbor to the south, Mr. James Conkle. Um, to review the application on his behalf. Um, in my review, um, a number of concerns, only one that I think deals with completeness, so I'll state that now and I'll come back up um, later to deal with the rest. Um, we're concerned that um, the application um, that has been submitted only contains stormwater calculations for the driveway itself. As we just heard from the applicant's representative, um, the prospective buyer plans to build a home on that property. And while they are stating here this evening that it will have a negligible effect on the overall stormwater um, uh, calculations, um, I don't think you can consider the application complete because you're not looking at those complete calculations. Um, the total impact of this project on stormwater in the area will be the sum total of both the driveway and any subsequent development that's done on either parcel. Um, so to, to make a ruling that at this time, based on partial information, um, I don't think would be the correct way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on completeness? Then I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm going to ask the board for their comments towards completeness. Carol Ann. I'm also concerned that the calculations we have, whether the calculations we have do we have any updated ones available or that they don't reflect um, a dwelling on the property and the potential impacts, which I know you said were negligible, but we don't have the calculations supporting that. Anyone else on completeness, the stormwater analysis? Well, while we're on that, how does, how does the proposed property that's going to dispose of its water? I mean. It's just, a, it's just a square there at the moment, but there's no plans that I can see for taking the water away from there. I mean, it, is it going to run down or is it going to be conducted into some levee in there? Sir. All right. Um, as far as stormwater is concerned, Nothing is changing as far as the micro watershed is concerned. There's no construction that's proposed for this area that's going to change any of the dynamic on the actual site itself at all. None. The driveway is already there. It's going to be slightly expanded as far as the private access way is concerned, but the runoff from that driveway from the lower section of the driveway, which is essentially from this turnout area down toward Clinton Street, 
um, is the same topography as it is right now. It's not going to be changed, it's not going to be altered. As far as the stormwater is concerned, as we mentioned before, we've actually, we've actually engineered improvements that are uh, at the bottom of Clinton Street regarding the runoff into the wetland area that's down in this area uh, that is going to improve that. And the town's review engineer has taken a look at that and, uh, and concurs. So as far as the answer to the second question is concerned, the watersheds of the stormwater are coming down this way, which is where they are now. Nothing is going to change there. For anything, and you'll see this in your plans as well, but anything in this particular area all the way around here actually flows to the pond, which it does now and which it's going to. There are absolutely, other than what you see in yellow, no changes whatsoever to the property. So there's not going to be any stormwater differences between what's there now and what we're proposing. Just one quick the area the topog topographic lines that you see right here yes this is the watershed map no I think we should go back to the other one you, you've got on the left of the, yes. the left of the yellow area there you've got right in here yes those lines Yes. Are they going lower from the left to yes. the right, or are they going... No, they're coming down this way. Which way is it going down? The high point is right here, just before it dips down. The, the, basically, the break point is right in this section, right through here. Right through the edge. Everything that goes down in this section goes to the pond. Everything that's in this section actually comes down this way. And, of course, we're not proposing to do anything in this area whatsoever, no changes from what's there right now. Uh, the, on, and the driveway, the existing driveway, where anything the sheet flows down the driveway to this point, uh, it actually continues to sheet flow across uh, this road. We've actually um, captured that water, and it's going to be culverted underneath this direction, right in here, so that everything that you see right here, with the exception of a small portion of this turnout, is already there. It's already at the site. And it's basically, it's sort of a valley. Is that what you're saying? Uh, the yellow is a valley. Not no, no, the, the yellow is the road. Yellow is the, the spine of the hill. Yellow is the pavement. The of the spine of the hill. That's what I'm trying to find out. From, from, from that level down. Yes. Right. Okay. Fine. Thank you. As far as one of the, uh, the comments earlier uh, by the gentleman from Normando um, regarding a house, we have done the calculations for a, a brief house. Obviously, we're not going to go to the architectural details of putting a house in a particular lot when we're looking at a private access way because we don't know until the private access way gets approved whether or not we can put a house there. Um, so to design an actual house to say, let's take a look at the actual you know, cubic inches, as it were, of stormwater is a moot point. What we do propose, obviously, or what June proposes, the prospective buyers, to put a house right in this particular area. Um, and the only section that is going to, or the, from a stormwater perspective, the only area that's going to be affected by that is the stormwater from this particular area that will hit the roof of the house, for instance, um, and then come right into the pond. Um, so that's until we actually get the approval of the, uh, the private access way. You know, we can make some assumptions regarding that size of the house that is going to be similar in character to other houses in the neighborhood. And we've already done that modeling, and that modeling shows that everything goes into the pond and is, again, virtually negligible in terms of its modeling. Thank you. Elaine? Yes. Oh, Maureen, do you want to know Elaine? If, if I understand you correctly, the house, the location, feasible location you see for the house would be between the private access way and the pond. Uh, well, it's, it's going to be in this particular area. I don't know if it's going to be right and there or not. Could right you there. redraw the building envelope to make that more explicit you have the build the way the building envelope is drawn in theory the house could be on the other side of the lot too um, in fact as i understand it the building envelope on the plan includes part of the driveway itself the way it yes. appears to me could you define it more specifically in terms of where you think in fact the lot would be suitable for a house well, given the last comment first, the suitability of the lot is to be able to put a, a house anywhere, theoretically, within the building envelope area. Um, so as far as that's concerned, we don't necessarily want to restrict something that's got the availability to put that house anywhere. What the prospective buyer now has indicated is that uh, she believes the house is going to go right in here. The answer to your question is, can we restrict something further? Sure, we can do anything. Um, should we actually do that? That would actually stymie anybody from, for instance, putting up maybe an external screen house or a shed 
or anywhere else on the property that they could otherwise do and then wouldn't be allowed to if we ended up shrinking a building envelope beyond the parameters of the zoning for the town. But you're telling us, telling us that for stormwater calculations on this lot, which is the one served by the private access way, that you're asking us to assume that any storm water from the house would flow into the pond. That assumption can only be made if the building envelope is restricted to the portion of the property that actually flows into the pond. Yes, which Otherwise, is actually... Otherwise, the, the flow could be, however, the flow would be on the other part of the property, which well, then could change it into the neighbors. The only place that any of uh, the watershed would flow, or the different watershed from that which uh, encompasses the pond, um, is this particular area right here. Right. And that is so incredibly steep that there is, you know, a highly, it's highly unlikely that anyone, no matter who it is, is going to build a house on a slope of that magnitude. This, for those of us who are out there, again, this is a plateau, right in this section, it's very flat, uh, and it's flat all the way up into about this section right here, and then there's a slight curve right over in this section that continues to go uphill. But right here, you can see that the, the proximity of the lines, what this means is uh, the many lines that you see here, the contour lines, the closer together they are, the steeper the slope. So in this particular case, we've got an exceptionally steep slope that comes down this way. Uh, the likelihood of anybody putting anything in that would, would require some major excavation and is not likely to go there. Right. To well, the it extent, would seem to me that the building envelope doesn't need to include that portion of the property. Again, we can put a building envelope any way we want to as far as restrictions. We'd be happy to do that. I don't think anybody's going to have any problem, any prospective buyer's going to have any problem by restricting the building in that particular area. I don't think anybody's going to go there anyway, but we can certainly show that. Uh, but again, keep in mind that pursuant to zoning regulations for the town relative to any particular lot, we've got a building envelope um, that goes all the way around the properties with these dimensions. But if you'd like to have it restricted, the board would like to be able to have a restriction and say, you know, we want to make sure that this is not an area to be built upon, we don't have a problem with that. Maureen? I was wondering if you could put up either the pre-development or the post-development drainage area map. And this is following up on the question that uh, Labor Member Fallender brought up. Okay, so the question I had was kind of to follow up the same thing. I was calling the major drainage area, drainage area D, because you've got a D there right above the pond. Is you following me so far? Mm -hmm. So again, the question would be, would you be willing to commit to only having a house and any new impervious area included in that drainage area? Because that way you can be consistent with your proposal that there's no additional drainage that's going to flow towards the neighbors. I think to, to take that one step forward that we could propose that any drainage would be directed towards the pond so even if the house wasn't situated over that particular drainage boundary line it could be guttered such that any runoff from the roof was directed back towards the pond. That might be helpful as, as long as it's also clear that that drainage is sufficiently filtered so that that pond remains amenable to the wildlife that's in it. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Peter, any questions or comments? No, I think this all speaks to the, the, the completeness issue at the moment and their assertion that the drainage will not be affected, so I think limiting the uh, basically. Make it, making it not possible to improve that area southwest of the pond. The steep slope is, that pretty much takes care of any completeness issues. I feel comfortable uh, going forward with completeness if we do tackle that. Does um, anyone else have any other comments in regards? Um, I, I, I also want to point out uh, that the town engineer is aware that the stormwater analysis did not include the future home in lot A in the report and that the town engineer had noted in his letter dated March 13th that in his comments he said the future home to be located on the new lot should be accommodated for in the drainage analyst analysis so you will be coming back with some numbers um, so that will be addressed before anything is finally approved just to make sure that your, your concern has been heard. Um, I would like to suggest that that might be a condition of approval. Uh, it's in the notes. I'm just pointing out that it, has, it was noted, it was picked up, and it, it's in the note of the town from the town engineer, 
and it will be in our condition of approval. We Great. normally do say um, something to the effect about the town engineer's letter that every item sure. in there be addressed. But I just want to point it out for the public record that the town engineer did pick up on that. And I think the assumption was it would be in lot D, which we can then tackle in a moment. Okay. Um, any other comments on this before we take a vote? On completeness, yes, Peter. Yeah, on completeness, I, mean, I don't know if this is a completeness or a substantive <coughs> issue, but the notion of there being no further development on the the, the properties and the, the applicant I evidently had said that was fine by them. You now it's just a question of creating a situation where that will actually happen. And they had submitted a deed which was sort of a self-declared restriction on further development, which the town council, I think, correctly said may not be all that effective. Um, is it, Maureen, you, you probably know the answer to this one. Is it possible in, in Maine to impose a, a, a conservation restriction? Oh, yes. On land? I, I would argue that would be a substantive review item rather than a completeness okay. item. Okay. Okay. Other than that, any other motion? I will take a motion, please. Motion. Motion for the board to consider. In order that based on the material submitted and the facts presented, the application of Winslow Pillsbury for a private access way permit to create a new lot at 10 Clinton Road is deemed complete. Second. Lane, seconded by Elaine. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of completeness? Opposed? And that also passes unanimously. So we have deemed it complete. And now we will be looking at a substance review. Um, did you have any more in your presentation that you wanted to address under the substance review before I do open it up to the public? Is there any additional? Uh, only to the extent that we would follow up with any questions. Uh, just we're keeping in mind we're trying to keep our focus on the actual private access way. Mm -hmm. And toward that end, um, I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have or go into further explanations if somebody has any okay. questions. Then, at this point, I will be opening it up to the public. Should the police chief, uh, chief excuse me, speak first? I believe, and I'm looking at the fire chief, that, that he has no prepared comments. He's only here to answer questions. Okay. So the board can ask him to come up and speak to questions at any time. All right. Well, I'll open it up to the public just in case they have any questions. And the fire chief is here. And does anyone have Jay. any? Anyone have any questions or comments in regards to this access way? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Again, my name is Jim Cassidy with Normando Associates, representing Mr. Conco, one of the abutters to the south. Um, I want to thank you for your consideration earlier of the, of the issue regarding um, a designation for the house and the stormwater. Um, I think it would help immensely to have that um, nailed down a little bit for everyone's purpose. Um, I do want to remind the board that um, this pond is not a stormwater management pond. Any water that is directed into it or any stormwater that is directed into it, whether it be by sheet flow, surface water, or guttering, um, will go into the pond. Um, the pond ha has a finite capacity with which to treat that stormwater um, before that stormwater leaves the property. And the, prop and the pond has a wetland swale outlet to the south, um, and you can see it on the map, um, that goes to the property line and then crosses Mr. Conkle's property. Um, so I want to remind everyone that um, at some point, and you haven't seen the calculations yet, um, the stormwater that's generated from the development on this new lot will affect the downstream, if you will, um, resources as the water leaves the pond. Um, to that end, um, I guess I would make my second point, um, and it's a bigger picture issue. Because this division um, will allow substantively future division of these two lots in theory, um, I think it would be incumbent upon the board to um, require the applicant to um, consider a long-term build-out for the pro properties. Effectively, what's happening if the board were to approve this private access application, um, you are eliminating one of the possible um, access ways to the back portion of both of these new lots. 
um, by putting a house in the location on the new lot that is being proposed, if I understand it correctly. Um, if Mr. Pillsbury in the future wanted to further subdivide his lot, the lot to the right, as you look at the map, the, real, the only real access way to get to the back portion of that lot would be across um, or close to the property line um, with my client, Mr. Conkel. Um, and that would almost certainly have stormwater impacts. It would have natural resource impacts because it would be crossing um, a wetland area um, as it goes to the rear of the property. So uh, the board might want to consider um, some sort of long-term build-out plan um, so that you're assured that additional impacts in the future are not going to adversely affect um, the drainage in the area and the natural resources in the area. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make any comments, have any questions? And I will be closing this, this portion of the public hearing. And let's see. Um, let's open it up to the board. Um, would anyone like to um, address any of the questions that have come up? Or do you have any other comments you'd like to make at this point? Elaine? I'd love to hear from the fire chief in terms of uh, how, from a practical point of view, this proposal for doing a preliminary build out of the driveway and then bringing in trucks and then having to redo all the work and how confident you feel at this point that the regrading as it's currently planned is in fact going to accommodate yes. your fire trucks. Because I know in the town engineer's letter, it still says that they're not satisfied with the scale of the drawings that have been done to date, that they're still not, if I understand it right, a sufficiently blown up scale to come to conclusions. So since you're the guy who knows the truck. Well, obviously, we look at it, and I rely on the engineer to tell me that it will work. I tell him that this is the truck that I have an issue with getting up that driveway. And I rely on them to make the calculations that say the truck will, in fact, be able to do it. And I think we talked earlier about before they pave and everything that we get the truck out there and make sure that it will make the... We're concerned about an angle of departure. The grade is steep, but whereas an existing driveway, I'm willing to live with that. If it was a new development, I would, I would be strongly opposed to the angle. That It's a steep driveway, but I feel once we get off the road that we can make the grade is not an issue. It's getting off the road. The trucks, the ladder truck in particular, will drag on the pavement. We had a chimney fire at Mr. Pillsbury's, and we did not take the ladder truck up there because we were concerned about the damage potential of taking it off the road with that angle of departure that exists. So at, at this point, is it your expectation that the angle of the departure that they're proposing is going to be? functional or you just really can't tell yet? I can't tell and, and I would rely on the, engineer, the town engineer saying that he believes it's acceptable and again before completeness of the project we would take the truck out there and make sure that it does meet in fact meet that angle of departure without damage to the vehicle. And I guess my only concern about that I'm comfortable with that if there is a level of confidence that in fact it will because my concern is once all the construction work has been done and all the digging has been done and everything's got its final grading just waiting for paving, that there's going to be a lot of pressure on the town to come to the conclusion that, ah, don't worry, it's all right. Um, and I think it's going to be very, because it would be very expensive at that point to come in and tear it all out and regrade it again. So unless we have a pretty solid expectation that it's going to work, I'm not sure I'm very confident going ahead and, and constructing it to those standards. I'm also concerned with the steepness and whether the steepness would be more concerning to you if you happen to be trying to get up there on an icy day. We know at this time of the year we do get a lot of icing and yeah. it's pretty hard to avoid icing on a steep driveway, I know, because I have one. Yeah. Um, and the steeper it is, the more problem that that is. So I guess I'm, I'm concerned. I, I agree with you. The, the steepness is a concern. But I, again, it's an existing driveway. And to correct that would be a, a huge excavation project. And I'm not, you know, if we were for one house, 
what's the volume of calls going to be there? I mean, obviously, from my perspective, I want to address this to make it the best I can from the fire department's angle of approach and stuff. But, you know, I, I think you have to rely on the homeowners we do in any private way to maintain that road to our standards. You know, is it going to be maintained as well as public works? I don't know, but public works, if we do have a fire and they are out, they're very good about making sure the road is sanded and salted before we, had, we approach it. So we do have that option, even though it is a private way. But that's if they're out. But, you know, the, the, obviously it's a very steep angle, and, and I have that concern. And in a perfect world, I would ask that that be a flat-level road. But I, I don't think I'm, that's a reasonable request. So I'm trying to make this the best I can from our perspective. Great. Thank you. Do you have any sense of the, from your familiarity with the annual departure and the drawings you've seen in discussions with the town engineer about the margin of error that the contractor has when he, when he does the, the grading and puts on the compacted surface? Are we talking fractions of an inch, several inches? Do you have anything? When we talked at the last meeting that Maureen and I had with the engineer, he did not feel comfortable with what the drawings that had been presented to us. So. If he's not comfortable, I'm, I'm not going to certainly be comfortable. I rely on his expertise there. And he's not comfortable that there's a good margin of error? Yeah, I believe he had a question on, on what that, on the drawings, if I'm correct. No. Hey, just one quick one on the hammerhead. That hammerhead is acceptable. We have a back, sorry. <laughs> the hammerhead. Um, backing the, the fire truck up and around there, there is no problem with, is there a problem with that hammer? Again, or is there's, there's a standard we use, a vehicle standard, it's called the B40 standard. I have no idea what that means, but the engineer tells me that that meets the standard for the ladder. I don't know what a B40, B52 is or anything. Just that the B40 standard it closely approximates the turning radius of our ladder truck. And if that turnaround meets the B40 standard in the engineer's mind, then we wouldn't have an issue with it. Thank you. Question, Maureen, does that meet the B40 standard or 18? The, and, and by the way, B40, I, I mean, the, the planning board has been working on the subdivision ordinance, and you, you now know that AASHTO is the Society of Engineers and all that. So the B40 standard is basically a classification of vehicle that has a particular turning radius. And that particular, there's, I don't know if there's a B30 and a B20, but B40 is the, is the vehicle that most closely approximates the ladder truck. So that's why we refer to that B40 vehicle. If, if it accommodates a B40 vehicle, it accommodates a ladder truck. And the applicant did submit um, drawings that showed a, a B40 size vehicle backing up into that turnaround and then coming back out. And I believe the town engineer was satisfied with those drawings. Okay, then. And if it meets the B40 standard, that's the, the ladder truck being our biggest vehicle, all the others can make the turning radius. So that's why we rely on that B40 standard. Okay, because um, a traditional turnaround in from our subdivision ordinance does show that it's 24 feet. And as you know, the applicant originally proposed 12 and a half, and now they're at 18. Um, but based on what the town engineer says, you are satisfied and you're fine that it will go from 24 feet to 18 feet. I'm comfortable Based on with the that. engineer's yes. information. Yes. Yep. Okay. I assume that's on a flat surface and not on an angled surface. Yeah, it's, a, it's a fairly flat surface where they're proposing to put that turnaround. Yes, certainly. Um, just thinking about a scenario, uh, two questions. If the back of the truck scrapes the curb when it actually comes out fully loaded and ready to fight the fire, what is the, what's the consequence of that? Is it um, damage to the truck that's expensive for the town to repair? or does it actually interfere with your ability to do what you need to do to fight a fire? Well, if the, if the truck is damaged, it would interfere with our ability. The ladder jacks that stabilize the truck when the ladder is in the air are behind the rear wheels. Those are the lowest point on the truck. If those drag and those are damaged, then we can't use the aerial because the truck won't, you can't put the aerial up without those ladder jacks down. Okay, so it, it does affect the firefighting it ability. Could, yeah. Okay, the other question is if for some reason you were there on an icy day trying to get up that steep drive and couldn't do it and had to fight the fire basically on foot using the hydrant down there at the 
on the road. And that's not there, by the way. There is one shown on the map. And I, I didn't bring it up, but the applicant is aware there is no hydrant there. There is no hydrant. So how, hydrant how, how would you fight that fire if it turned out you couldn't get up? I'm just trying to think about what, what's the risk factor here. Depending on where the house is, we could go in from Oakwood if that's the closer approach to the rear of the house. It, it would, depend, would have to, you know, what the conditions are and where we want to go in, but we can, either way, it's going to be very difficult. If you can't, the further you have to go with the hose, the harder there it is. But there's, there, and there, what, what is the closest hydrant to this it's house? It's on uh, Route 77, just north mm -hmm. of Clinton Road. It's probably 800 feet, maybe 1,000. So didn't measure you have it. a hydrant on the plan? It's an error that the applicant has agreed to fix. I guess you could use the palm. If I could get up there. And we certainly can use the pond. But I, if we can get a truck close to it, we have to get within about 20 feet of the pond oh, to that do that. The distance for pumping? Well, no, we have to, you have to lift the water, and the, and the pump will only lift so high. It's about a six-foot vertical lift. So. Elaine, you're all set? Mm-hmm. Thank you. No problem. Are there any questions for the fire chief? Carolyn? Henry, you're all set? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, any other questions? Or I, I do want to talk about the build-out that, that has been presented for us. But before we go there, does anyone have other questions? Any other questions or comments? I guess I had a concern about the, what, the propose, what the best proposal is for actually restricting this to, the la, this to a, a two-lot division and precluding further subdivision. I'm concerned by the note on the plan that basically says this is restricted because that's what the town has required when in fact I don't see any condition that says that the town has in fact required it. I don't think the language that's proposed works um, and I would want to make sure that if that's our assumption that there will never be any further division of these lots that it be done in a way that our town attorney considers to be binding and to me the note on the plan doesn't do it. And I wouldn't propose to draft other language because I think it's kind of a complicated thing to do. But if that's what the agreement is, I guess an additional condition would be that binding language be added as a note on the plan as approved by the town attorney. Okay. Anyone like to follow up on that, Colin? Yeah. I'm, I think Elaine and I are probably headed the same direction. The, uh, it's not as much the further division of the property as it is the use of the property. In other words, the further improvement of any of the back lands. Um, and I, Maureen, do you and I have the same reading of the town council's letter on that proposed deed to oneself imposing a restriction on development? I don't think it's effective. But would not a conservation restriction on the, you know, all land basically north of the pond uh, a conservation restriction which with the right of the town or the land trust or something to enforce wouldn't that take care of the problem yes it would and and you know there, this isn't finalized because it's been raised by staff a few times and pretty much I've been waiting to hear how the board wants to go on it but uh, it's not a question of the town telling the applicant you can't further divide the property right. it's really a choice it's suggesting to the applicant either come up with a master plan that allows for future development in a logical way without getting it approved right now, but at least showing that if there's, a one, if there's one good way to get to that back land and then you put a house in that way, then you've let out the one best option and you've left with worse options. And if the applicant doesn't want to look at that, then the other option would be we don't need to provide a master plan because we have closed the door permanently. And uh, I understand what you're both saying, and I agree that, that the proposals that are before you are not a permanent closure. It's a, you know, for now, it's okay. But my understanding is if you put a restriction on a deed, the owner, the person who put the restriction on can lift the restriction off. 
Right. So yes, putting a restriction on yourself isn't really much of a restriction. Um, putting a note on a plan does not close the door. Anyone can come back at any time and ask the planning board to change those notes and therefore you're reopening the door. My understanding, one of the best ways to do it is to put a restriction on there that has a third party do the enforcement. Okay. So um, it could be a conservation restriction, it could just be a restriction that no further development occur. Um, and I think if the board feels strongly one way or the other, the better approach would be to give the applicant direction instead of trying to draft it. Right. And saying, this is the standard we want you to meet, come back with what you're, how you're going to do it. Am I correct that well, my concern with the way it's drafted now is it says that the planning board of the town has, has prohibited further subdivision. I don't think we have the authority to do that. So if you say on the plan, that we have purported to do it, I think that restriction could easily be nullified because that would be beyond what we have the authority to do. So I, I think more, I would be inclined to go with Maureen. Either we get a land conservation easement that deeds to another party any rights you might have to further develop it, or you go forward and give us a general idea of how that would be done. If I may, there's an option in the regulation that states we either do what you just asked, um, a full build-out scenario, or we go on record, which we have now many times, including in the prospective deeds that the town requested last time, and on the plan, irrespective of what the language is. If you want some different language, that's fine. But both the seller and the buyer have stated repeatedly that they're, as far as they are concerned, however restrictive you want to make it, there are no further plans to develop this property, period. So I'd have to meet with our client to make sure you know, how they would want to put any conservation easement on the property. But I think we're, we're digressing, even though it's all part of the same project, we're digressing from the actual private access way. If we're saying on the record that the property is not going to be further divided, it's on the plan and it's in the deeds, yes, indeed, anybody can change anything. That's a comment that I made last time. Anything that's going to come before this board as far as any potential um, redevelopment in you know, 2019 or whatever it might be has to come before the board anyway, and the board does not have to approve that. But anything at any point, no matter whether it's a lawyer or anybody else, can always be changed. We've already gone on record as saying we don't intend to do that. We didn't put that in the deeds initially. The town wanted it or the board wanted it that way. We put that in the deeds. It's now about as restrictive as I think you can possibly get with the people, with the, both the buyer and, or the, uh, the seller and the buyer stating it's not going to be further developed. I'm not sure what further we can do to be able to state that. Well, it's, but it would be since there's an economic benefit to, a, to both the buyer and the seller potentially in the future to allow further development it is quite foreseeable that it would be in the interest in the future of both the buyer and the seller to change their agreement. So that's why I think it's, the, it's important to have a third party whose interest might be different if in fact you're trying to create an enforceable restriction on the property. A statement of intent is not enforceable if the two parties who so state change their minds. Okay, so be it. Then that, I would ask that that be a condition of the approval because we're not going to go and put a restriction on a property before we get any approval of that. Suddenly the shackles are on, right. we've got a restriction, and we don't have approvals. That's basically telling somebody what they can do with their private property. And then I guess our question for you is would you prefer that we condition this approval on a binding conservation easement precluding further development, or would you prefer to bring us a proposed plan for further build-out? The choice is really yours or your clients. I would tend to think that we'd probably go for the former. Um, I mean, it's, it's, and I understand the board can ask for anything that it wants, but it's, that's not at all clear in the regulation. There's one sentence that talks about further restriction, and we've met that. We don't have a problem with this. The bottom line is both parties that are inter interested in the property right now have already said multiple times that they have no intention of doing this further. So toward that end, if we need to go to the land trust or somebody else, if they're willing to take a portion of that, that's very likely going to happen. 
Um, but again, I would ask that as a condition of approval before we actually do that and then find out that the approval doesn't come. Sure. Mm. Right. Of course. Yeah, fair enough, but you, with all respect, you understand this a statement of intention right now doesn't have a whole lot of shelf life if the people involved don't want it to. So all we're really talking about is an enforceable covenant that's enforceable by a third party, and that will assure that it stays in No, I understand, and I don't think our clients are going to have any problem with that, um, having already gone on record as saying they don't. So that's, that's absolutely fine. And if the town would like to have the town's attorney come up with the language, that's fine too. Um, whatever that language might be, I would imagine it would be acceptable. We'd like to see it, obviously, but I would imagine that that would be acceptable to, uh, to our clients. Okay. Um, I am inclined, I brought that up at the last meeting, so I am inclined to agree, and because of our numbers tonight, it looks like it'll be going in that direction. I, I just want to point out that um, I think the real reason we need this is because you are in the RC district. And this lot is large enough for more than two homes. And given that that is a basic fact, and we always, in the planning, look towards the future, I would say this does need to be addressed because things can be changed, and this lot can accommodate more than two homes in some manner. So that is why I would tend to agree that we do need something that is, that is truly binding and permanent, though I do appreciate the efforts, and I, I do believe that the two uh, people represented here do not wish to further subdivide, but their land will eventually be passed on and sold down the line, and we want this to be binding and permanent for whoever the owner will be in the future. That's my thoughts on that. Um, Anyone else like to make any other comments? Um, either a build out or a, a language? Not on that particular topic, no. <laughs> okay. So we'll be adding some language um, that will be agreed upon by uh, the town attorney, and of course you'll be seeing that and Great. reviewing it. Okay. Um, at this point, any other? Comments or questions? Or? I have a question for Maureen. If we restrict the location of any further construction to the portion of the property that drains <coughs> into the pond and provide for some kind of filtration of whatever water goes into the pond, do we also or should we also um, more clearly define the building envelope? Because to me, as I'm looking at the plan, it looks like the building envelope includes the driveway, includes part of the private access way. I guess another question is, technically, I'm not sure where the private access way ends and the driveway begins, or if everything in yellow is the private access way. Yes, everything in yellow is the private access way. And the plan, the site plan that you have before you, that which we would ostensibly sign, does not have the building envelope running down the, uh, the middle of the driveway. It goes around the pond. It goes around the edges of the property and around the access way. And I, I believe, I mean, when I've looked at this plan, my assumption has been that you just can't see it, that the dotted line that shows the building envelope is the same line as the right of way for the private access way. So okay, it I don't see that on the plan when I look at it you either. You can't see it because, yes, <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, potentially the applicant could think of a way to make that a little clearer, or maybe a note that says, you know, this is the boundary of the building envelope, but you, you also have this other issue of uh, if you are going to not have um, any drainage draining out, if, you're ha if you don't want any impervious surface draining to anything but the pond area, you're going to need to either change the building envelope, actually you should probably do both, you should probably change the building envelope as much as you can and then still put in a restriction that says any drainage from the impervious surface created by the new home can't be heading south or west. And I believe the engineer for the applicant has suggested that even if they place the house outside of the current drainage area that goes towards the pond, they can still pick up drainage with guttering. So in the end, you're saying we sh that we should or should not redraw the building? I'm saying that the building envelope should, sh I, I think you could, I mean, if the applicant is saying that that area to the south of, 
almost all of the area to the south of that, that private access way is not going to be used for building, then you probably shouldn't have a building envelope there. But then there is a garage. Well, you would, I, I wouldn't draw the building envelope so tightly that you're not including the garage. Okay. But you, you probably want to eliminate, I would think you could still eliminate 60 to 80 percent of it. I'm looking so, at the applicant to see what, if he can see how this might work. So when you say that the entire yellow area is the private access way? Yes. Does that mean that the, both properties have some rights in that in terms of fire equipment backing up? Yes, and the applicant has submitted um, a what we call reciprocal easements. And those and go all the way up to the garage? Um, do they, no. I do not believe, I believe the no. benefits for a lot Rate two about. go up Rate to the turnaround, and then the benefits for a lot one go all the way up. Yes, <clears throat> okay. that's correct. To me, that wasn't clear from the plans, but perhaps it is from the language of the documents. And, and the town attorney complained that, well, his concern was that the easements are drafted so that you're granting an easement to yourself. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you, you wouldn't grant the easement until you actually right. sell the law yeah. and the name would have to be changed. And I mean, if I could. Yes. Um, there are a lot of legal documents that do need to be finalized. Typically what the board has done is they have created a condition that made it clear what their goal of the legal documents is, but we haven't dictated the actual language. We've relied on our town attorney to work with the applicant's attorney, and I like not being in between those two attorneys, and they just work out the language and then they provide the final approved document. Yeah, I'm just trying to think how I would just how I would describe that building envelope if I don't have it in front of me to see, and I'm not trying to think of how we could you craft could, that well, language you, without actually. You could suggest that the southerly property, the southerly building envelope line, occur immediately south of the existing garage. Would that work? And go where? It, well, then you still keep the rest of it. It, it would start. It would move up. It would be an area right like in this section right in here. Correct. But it would be parallel to the current one, just moved up. Uh, parallel to this one. Yeah. Yes, and it would be moved up into this particular section. Right. Anyone have any comments about moving that line? Anyone else? People feeling that they want to move that line? Then? Makes sense. Okay. All right. Um, so with, that's on the building envelope. Um, and adding a, a note about the drainage of the new home being directed towards the pond. Something to that effect. Any comments on that? What was that? Sorry, I missed you. A, a note being added that the drainage of the new home be directed towards the pond. Yeah, I think, that's also I think just having it, yeah. yeah. That Changing the, and that makes sense? Makes sense? Okay. All right. Um, I was also going to propose that we add a note that indicates on sheet two that the turnaround is 18 feet wide. I, I believe there's another sheet further in that shows that it's 18 feet. I'd like it on sheet two because that's the sheet that will actually be sent over to the Registry of Deeds. Okay. Fine I mean, with you? Yeah, just, yeah, just marking that the turnaround is eight, because it is a waiver down from 24. So I just wanted to make sure it shows up on sheet two, which will end up in the registry. Is, is sheet two also one that shows the fire hydrant that's not really there? Let's see. I believe it does. Yes, um, it does. Sheet two does show the hydrant. They've agreed to change that in the next iteration of plans. But I would think if, if we're talking about doing an approval tonight, that should be a condition. Unless it's in the letter. I didn't remember seeing it. In the I don't remember it being in the engineer's letter. That could be a condition. Did you say number eight? What, in the engineer's letter, which 
I, I didn't see the, the hydrant in the engineer's letter. Did you find it, Carolyn? No. But we can add that in our motions. Okay. Any other comments in regards to this plan? I'd like to go to the engineer's letter. Yes. And just, I know this may sound very basic to you, but I'd just like to go, some of the points have been addressed, but could you go point by point and make sure that everything has been addressed that the engineer has stated? Certainly. Thanks. Um, so I call your attention to the letter dated uh, March 13th. Uh, number one, I'm not going to read through all these. I think you've already taken a look at them, but uh, essentially they were talking about the 5% grade, which the chief has already addressed, which the engineer has already commented on that uh, that does actually work, and it's, he states that it's a considerable improvement over what's there now, which it is. On uh, number two, um, he's talking about the, uh, the fire chief's request about accessibility. Could I? This is... Yeah. I'm sorry. If I could interrupt you, under paragraph one, second paragraph they've asked for drawing uh, without exaggeration of the vertical scale are you willing to provide that you already have that yeah it was already submitted. we already showed that last time and submitted that they said it still has an exaggeration we submitted both yes you still have the the actual exaggeration which is an engineer's scale read you also have the other one in your packet that shows the non-exaggerated scale in fact we had that on the wall last time last meeting we were here but this later letter is dated march 13th so apparently the town engineer doesn't think you have it. He missed it. It's in the packet. <laughs> My concern is that what you think is what the town engineer is asking for isn't what the town engineer thinks he's asking for, because he's made this comment both times, and both times you've said you already have it. No, the first time you made it, we didn't show, we showed the exaggerated scale, which is typical. We did not have the actual reduced scale, significantly reduced, and we brought that to the meeting because we're not allowed to submit it after the original submission. We showed that on the wall the last time, and then you've got that in your packet. Um, Steve, uh, the uh, 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 reviewing engineer did not see it the first time because it wasn't there. The, the exaggerated scale is there, which is the same dimensions. It's just an exaggerated scale to be able to show the entire stretch into one piece of paper. But we showed that otherwise, and you must have missed the second one. But that's fine. I mean, we can get him. Steve can can enter in on that. Yeah, you know, we can show it right now if you like. I think I mean, he's talking about this submission package, is he not? In the town letter. So we can have. I, I can tell you, I, I met with I met with the town engineer and the, the fire chief was there, and they were very clear that they still did not have a plan that did not have an exaggerated vertical scale. They're not satisfied with the packet as we now have. Correct. Okay, that's what I thought. This, that wasn't for the engineer, that was for the town. And the engineer knows how to read an exaggerated scale. What, what I call your attention to right now is the same document that we showed to you last month. Right. This is the non-exaggerated scale. This shows exactly what the exaggerated scale does, but from a non-engineering standpoint. It's a much smaller plan, obviously, because it only details the cross-section of where the road leaves Clinton Road. The exaggerated scale shows the entire access way, which is typical. This is more for your benefit to be able to see that in a non-exaggerated scale, the actual mathematics does work in terms of the grade of that particular area. There was not a requirement for this in the regulation. It was a suggestion by, Steve, by the uh, uh, reviewing engineer for your benefit to be able to take a look at that. That's what this is. That's, I, I respectfully disagree with that reading of the town engineer's letter. He, I interpret the town engineer's letter as saying that he, the engineer, not us lay people, is not able to conclude from the documentation provided that the calculations are correct. So I guess I would want to, I think there's a misunderstanding either between you and the town engineer or you're correct, and the town engineer just forgot to edit a paragraph of his letter. I'm not willing to conclude that he forgot to edit, edit the letter, so I, I think we need an additional condition that we get that the town planner has provided written confirmation by the town engineer that the town engineer, in fact, has the drawings, because the written letter we have now doesn't say that. That's fine. 
And I mean, yes, we don't have a problem with that, but one of the conditions is that all the town engineer's comments have to be addressed anyway, so right. we're certainly prepared to do right. that. Okay, but I, I think we need to make it very clear. You think they have been. The town engineer is telling us they have not been. Right, but you will address the engineer's letters and it will be cleared in the end. Absolutely, Either right way. behind you. Right, okay. No, it's not. That's the problem. So I, I'm, I'm concerned going forward with an approval if what we're buying ourselves is an argument between you and the town engineer as to whether it's, it's been satisfied or not. No, there's, please, there's <laughs> no argument case, here. In that case, I think we need to wait another month and get another letter from the town engineer telling no. us that it's been done. I respectfully suggest we don't need to wait another month. He's saying in his letter that it's not. Maureen is telling us that it's not. You're continuing to insist that it is. We're not going to buy ourselves an argument post-approval. It's the same concern I had with the fire chief. I'm not going to give an approval that's simply buying the town a dispute. I'd rather postpone and table for a month, have you come back when we're not buying ourselves a dispute. I don't think we're buying ourselves any dispute whatsoever. One of the conditions that you've already stipulated 20 minutes ago, is that, which is typical, is that the town engineer pursuant to any conditions of approval, has to be approve everything that he has found. That's typical. We have no argument with that whatsoever. That's absolutely fine as a condition of approval. All I'm saying is that what he's referring to is right there. That's where my problem is. Well, he because has the town engineer is telling us that that is not the case. But you will be working with this, with the town engineer, to clarify that because it is key. It does say we are not able to confirm the fire chief's request that the drive be accessible without any hindrance. So it's very important that this is cleared up between you and the town engineer, which you will be doing. Whether it's this no drawing, an additional drawing, whatever it takes, because that is very important that the fire truck be able to go up. And it will be addressed, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, the, the last sentence in paragraph one says it should clearly indicate the clearance of the fire truck transitioning. And when I asked the chief about his level of confidence, he said he didn't have one because the, the, the drawings weren't able to substantiate what you're proposing to do. So I, I take that as a fairly clear instruction to make sure your drawings are pretty clear on this point that it's going to pass muster. I think in this case we should add that we get written confirmation from the town engineer that he is satisfied that his conditions have been met. Can we, we put that as a, yeah, I just, do, do we always get that? I, I do, because I like, you know, I like to put paper in the file. So actually, almost every project we have, I will get something by email or whatever that says he's reviewed the most recent submitted plans and they address his letter of X date. So maybe we should ask for a letter to that effect. If that's what you want, that's what we'll get. I would like to in this case, yes. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on number one for the applicant? Then number two on the letter. Uh, the meat of number two is the second sentence, which it refers to a note should be added to the plan stating that the private access way shall be inspected under the direction of a PE. Um, we've already stated earlier this evening that we're happy to do that. In fact, that that's very prudent. We're planning on doing that anyway. You want to make sure, you meaning anybody, wants to make sure that the construction of anything, whatever it might be, actually adheres to the design plans. Toward that end, uh, we'll have one of our PEs certainly be there and uh, take a look at that. Uh, number three refers to the invert elevations uh, being added and in a large detail view that's already in the plan set. Um, but we will have the town's engineer take a look at that and confirm that. Uh, number four, we already discussed that previously uh, when the chief was here regarding the uh, access. Uh, modifying the drawing to show the turnaround at 18 feet, it is. Number five, uh, talks about the uh, uh, the size of the uh, pipe, the water pipe, going from one and a quarter to one and a half inch, that's already stipulated on the plan sets that you have, so it's done. And again, 
the town engineer will review all of this. Number six, uh, there, is, uh, there was a question at one point about um, using reclaimed asphalt that was never actually approved, it was never intended, uh, it was never on the plans, it will be asphalt. And number seven, talking about an alteration to the, uh, the driveway entrance footprint within the right of way. Uh, we actually increased the ability of, as the chief had mentioned earlier, uh, to make the turnout, as you'll note, at the bottom of the driveway, right at Clinton Road, there's a utility pole right there. And the existing driveway is actually just beyond that pole, which is easy enough, generally speaking, for an automobile to navigate around fairly simply, perhaps not so much for a larger vehicle such as the fire engine. So what we've done is we actually moved that uh, away from the fire pole and cor excuse me, away from the utility pole and uh, put that corresponding section that, uh, for the private access way for the expansion of that particular area, the entrance of the driveway on the other side of that. So that radius has been uh, um, addressed without any issue. Uh, number eight talks about a, a common trench detail should be modified to reflect changes. Uh, the yellow warning tape on those trenches, that's already uh, been addressed as well in the plans. Steve, is already, uh, the engineer has already taken a look at that, but again, that will be part of his comments uh, back to Maureen. And then uh, number nine, uh, the future home to be located on the lot uh, should be accommodated for in the drainage analysis. We don't have a problem with that in theory, but you're asking us or what he's basically referring to is, uh, unless we're allowed otherwise, we don't know exactly what the dimensions are. We, this house hasn't been architecturally designed yet and the prospective buyer would like not to have to put the money into an architectural design until she knows that she can actually acquire the lot once the lot is created. However, from a calculation standpoint, we're absolutely happy to make an assumption based on a house that is very similar to those that are in the area, which is typically what will go there, and then show those calculations uh, that Steve will actually uh, take a look at, and we'll show those calculations for the stormwater that goes into the existing pond. So we have no objection to anything on here whatsoever. It's, it's very easy to do. Okay. Any follow-up questions, Carolyn? Anyone else have any questions as to the engineer's letter? Sorry. Any, any other questions in regard to the engineer's letter? No? Any other questions or comments? Elaine is furiously writing over here. The motions, yes. Conditions. Everyone all set? Does are you all set? Um, any other questions? Okay. I think most of my questions and concerns will be taken care of as we put the conditions into the motion. So, uh, if the board does not have any more questions or comments, would anyone like to make a motion? Yes. Yeah. Mark, do you need a moment? <laughs> you need a moment? I need a moment. She needs a moment. Okay. <laughs> During this time, then, I'll just point out that we did receive some correspondence. I'm not sure if the um, homeowner is in attendance, but uh, we have answered most of the questions in regards to um, water runoff. And, um, and there was a question about, is there uh, capacity in our wastewater and sewage infrastructure? Can it handle another residence? And I just want to point for the record that we did receive a letter from the Public Works that, can, that does confirm that there is adequate sewage capacity and uh, that also the Public Works Director agrees that the drainage situation in the roadway would be not much different than what exists today. Also in that letter, there was concerns about traffic congestion during the construction process and property values. And I just want to note that that is beyond uh, the scope of the Planning Board. Elaine, how are you doing down there? <laughs> are we, do we have a note here, I seem to recall that we do, that no building is permitted out specifying what ha can happen in the building open and outside of the building um, 
proposed condition number four is that a note be added to the plans that activities outside the building envelope shall be limited to the construction of driveways and utilities. Okay. Oh, Maureen, just one, one okay, question on the conditions. Bad. We've done a lot of on the on the driveway and the the fact that we'll accommodate the fire truck and if for some reason it would not early in the game there was a notion of the alternative solution was that the new house would have to be sprinkler is that falling aside now and if it doesn't pass muster that they just have to right stop and, and you may want to i'm gonna i don't want to speak for the fire chief but that was kind of the early approach right. but i think we've moved on to the whole idea that it, we really need to be able to get the truck up there okay so and if it doesn't pass muster they've got to fix it that's that's, That's the approach the we're talking okay. now. That you know they would they would go in, they would grade it. Um, the town would be able to check it. If it doesn't work, um, then they've got to fix it. Right. And that would be before you put the pavement on. Right. Okay. What is the truck that needs to get up there? It's the ladder truck. And the ladder, the, the, the uh, our emergency services, they have ambulances, they have pumper trucks. The ladder truck seems to be the one that has the most demands for space. So okay. that's the one we set the standard for. Okay. Well, I'll give it a go. Elaine, you like to make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and uh, plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Winslow Pillsbury for a private access way permit to create a new lot at 10 Clinton Road. Oh nope, wrong one. <laughs> oh okay, we already did. The findings of fact comes first. Strike that. Findings of fact. One, Winslow Pillsbury is proposing to create a new lot located at the end of Clinton Road, which requires review under Section 1979 private access way permit. Two, the town engineer has identified revisions needed to the plans to ensure that town standards are met. Three, a road maintenance agreement and reciprocal easements need to be established to assure the maintenance of and access to the private access way. Um, Okay. Four, the planning board finds that a waiver of the 5% maximum slope requirement should be granted because the driveway is existing. It will provide access to no more than one additional lot. It will be reconstructed as needed to minimally accommodate town emergency vehicles and strict adherence to the maximum slope standard will result in substantial reconstruction and disturbance of a much larger area. Five, the proposed private access way will exceed the maximum 5% slope and should be reconstructed as needed to assure access by emergency vehicles with special attention to the angle of departure for the ladder truck. And here I'd like to add a new finding by they maybe. Um, the applicant has agreed that an easement affecting lot A and lot B on, on the property will be granted enforceable by a third party, which will restrict the properties to more, no more than one residence on each property. And that easement will be enforceable by the third party unless I already said that. Six, a building envelope has been labeled on the plans, but no description of what the building envelope means has been included. Seven, the application substantially complies with section 1979 private access ways. Building That's going to come in conditions. Um, and in the last one, I'd like to put at the end of number seven, 
for that I just said um, add, provided that the following conditions are met. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Winslow Pillsbury for a private access way permit to create a new lot at 10 Clinton Road be approved subject to the following conditions. That the plans be revised in accordance with the town engineer's letter dated March 13, 2013, and that a letter from the town engineer confirming that the plan has been so revised be submitted to the town planner. Two, that the road maintenance agreement and reciprocal easements be revised per the town attorney's comment signed and recorded prior to the issuance of the building permit. Three, that an enforceable, is that? Mm -hmm. that an enforceable easement be granted by the property owner to an outside third party, an enforceable conservation easement be granted to an outside third party, providing that a maximum of one single family residence is permitted to be built on each of lot A and lot B shown on the plans and that no further development shall be permitted of either lot. Uh, number four, that after final grading and compacting of the driveway and before paving, the fire chief shall inspect the driveway to determine that a sufficient angle of departure has been created, and here this is an additional part, to allow unimpeded access by the ladder truck. No paving shall occur until the driveway has been graded to comply with the approved plans. Um, the approved plans are going to be engineering consideration. Yeah, it has been graded, yeah. That's right, no paving shall occur and no building permit for any resident shall be issued until the driveway has been graded to meet these requirements. Does that make it? Okay. Um, that the building envelope on the plan be modified by relocating the southerly boundary of the building envelope to a line parallel with the current, with the boundary of, um, southern boundary of the envelope as currently shown on the plan, but moved northward um, to extend a, along the southernmost side of the existing garage. Well, it doesn't exactly because the, it's at a different angle. Yeah, approximately along the southern boundary of the existing garage. For lot A? For lot A, on lot A, right, on lot A. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what was that last, the last comment that you just made? Lot A. No, no, no before that, as far as the uh, proximity. Approximately the along the southern, southerly most boundary of the garage. Um, I'd like to be able to put just a slight buffer in there because if that garage ever needs to be repaired or has you know, a lean-to woodshed against the side of it or something like that, we'd rather not limit it to where the garage now sits. I was actually going to make the same suggestion that you make it offset, what, 10 feet? Fine. 10, 10 feet. feet? Okay. Yeah, offset about 10 feet. Um, that a note be added to the plan that the private that no portion of the private access way is included within any building envelope and that activities outside of the building envelope shall be limited to the construction of driveways and utilities. And 
that the drainage from any new building constructed on lot A or lot B. Can we restrict drainage on lot B, Maureen? Probably not. Okay. From any new building constructed on lot A, flow in the direction of the pond, or flow to the pond, and that any drainage water be adequately treated? I'm not sure what standard to use for I would respectfully suggest that the applicant has proposed a 10-foot wide buffer around the pond and that you rely on that buffer to do the treatment that it needs to do. And if you're not comfortable that 10 feet is enough, that maybe you look at widening the buffer rather than making a suggestion for treatment that we're not going to be able to enforce. I'm not confident to say that a 10-foot buffer is sufficient or not to provide drainage to the pond. Well, and the other issue is that a mowed lawn provides less um, filtering capacity than a naturally vegetated area. Right? A 10-foot buffer. Can we just say that adequate, that adequate filtration it, 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 yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what standard. I believe when you speak with the code officer next week, he'll explain why there's no way he can enforce that. I mean, if you want something that you can rely on, I would suggest you you look at just a real buffer and not talk about filtration, because the only way to enforce it would be to require you know water quality testing, and we've tried that sometimes, and it doesn't work so well. Did the town engineer? Con no. talk about the adequacy so no. in in the past I mean what the town has really done is we've relied on the town's great desire for buffers to do a lot of that filtering and we've never actually required water well only in one instance have we ever required annual water quality testing to see if the buffers that we have in place are protecting the water quality but because of the amount of development here, which is not that much, I would suggest you just look at making sure your buffer is meaningful and leave it at that. And how do we determine whether 10 feet is meaningful or not meaningful? You, we, don't ha we are relying on um, good judgment rather than scientific fact. Whose judgment? The judgment of the board. We're talking about runoff from the roof of the from the house right? driveways and roofs yeah i mean patios whatever small amount that is, it doesn't wouldn't appear to be carrying more than a normal load of stuff off the roof right right and i mean any any vegetated buffer you require will improve the quality the water quality of the pond and as i said a, a mode buffer isn't as effective as a naturally vegetated buffer. You have in the past required people to leave a buffer that was just natural vegetation and they couldn't, they had to leave it alone. I, mean, I, I don't know how you treat runoff from the, from the you know, the, the roof and the, and the patio. Yeah, what happens is it hits the ground, it flows toward the pond, and if you've got some, you know, vigorous vegetation, yeah, the vegetation can, can absorb things in the water that you don't want to end up in the pond and they pull it down and they use it themselves. And it's why we have these huge buffers around wetlands in Cape Elizabeth. What is a typical... And they're very inexpensive. I mean, if you're not looking to use vegetative buffers, then you're looking at phosphorus controls and those techniques are incredibly expensive and that's why we, you know, for most applicants, just maintaining a buffer is a, a no-cost way to address this concern. So a naturally vegetated 10-foot buffer? Well, I'm not saying 10 feet's the magic number. I mean, I'm looking at the applicant. Maybe the applicant would be willing to, you know, offer a little bit more than 10 feet. Or maybe the applicant would be willing to say, only 10 feet, but we won't mow it anymore, and it'll be more vegetated, and it'll be improved. But I assume they want access to the pond. So it has to and there's nothing that says you couldn't, I mean, if you were in a shoreland zone, in this property, it not, does not fall right. within the shoreland zone. But if you're in the shoreland zone, you're allowed to have a path to the water. Right. It's just it's not supposed to be, you know, a straight shot so the water runs right into the pond. You could have a, I think it's six feet wide path that it's allowed. And 
you know, frankly, there's, there's a lot of mowed area around this pond. And Could we say that a buffer be maintained around the pond consistent with the sta buffer standards that would apply were this in a shoreland zone? Does that work? Um, the problem with that is that in the shoreland zone, you're not supposed to be putting anything within 75 feet. And this this building is, I believe, is within 75 feet of the edge of the but pond. But could, yes. could we no? Could we just say that we're going to go with 10 feet? But in terms of what you can do in that buffer, we're going to apply the same standards that would apply in the shoreland zone. Yeah, you could say leave it alone except for a, a path not exceeding six feet wide. Is that what the shoreland zone says? Yes, except well, there's also some timber harvesting provisions. We don't want to go there. <laughs> we don't want to go there. How do you enforce any of it? You don't. You well, you, you enforce it by being very clear, and you enforce it by not being subjective. And that's why I'm saying things like well, yeah. set a number. Most people will go out there and, and generally agree on where the, the edge of the pond is and, move and measure back. And you can go out there and say, OK, you haven't, you haven't put anything within 10 feet of the pond or you haven't mowed within 10 feet of the pond. That's, that's almost enforceable. So could it be as simple as 10 foot natural, natural vegetative buffer? Yeah, could be. OK, so let's go back then in the last condition. I can't remember what number I'm on, but whatever it is. I believe so it's I'll number be six. OK, number six. OK, that the drainage from any new building constructed on lot A Surface water drainage, storm water drainage. Surface you said, drainage. you said drainage flow to the pond. Okay. And period. Period. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as another condition, number seven, that a ten-foot naturally vegetated buffer be maintained around the edge of the pond. That can be determined. Um, provided that each of the two residences shall be permitted an access pathway no wider than six feet. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess one question would be on a pond like this, does one know where the edge of it is? On this pond, all the pictures I've seen and what I've seen with my own eyes, it's got a fairly defined edge. Does it have? Okay. So that works. Then. Is that fair? Yes. Did I get everything? And I'm, a, and, and I'm, a, I'm looking at the applicant and I am asking, is it clear that this does not mean naturally vegetated is a lawn? Right. It, it's the DEP definition of natural vegetation, which is not a lawn, not a manicured lawn. Okay. Um, I would also note about the fire hydrant. Oh, yes. You had some from the plans that on page two of the plans, the, the depiction of the fire hydrant be removed. And Victoria, you had something else you wanted added on page two? That a note be added to sheet two of the plan indicating the turnaround is 18 feet wide. I'll accept that. You don't want to put a Thank number, a specification number? That would be whatever? That would be the next one, I guess. Okay. So the two of those. Anybody else have anything they want to add to my motion? I have a, a suggestion, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> Going let, me back. The, let me make the motion here, and then we can talk about amendments, OK? Um, Did you have another? Uh, no, this is a correction of one of the amendments. No, just a clarification. The references you made to an easement about no further development, I don't think it is really an easement. It's more of a restriction running with the land. It's not, a, I mean, an easement isn't, we're not requiring to give somebody rights to use the land in a certain fashion. It's a restriction. That's why I called it a conservation easement? Well, I'd say a conservation restriction. An easement and a restriction, they're both, the, to me, they're both the same. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not really, but, well, that's, are we requiring specifically a conservation restriction or simply a restriction suitable in, to the town in the substance that will prevent further? Uh, I'm actually granting an easement because you are granting rights in the property to a third party 
to enforce something regarding the use of the land. So I would yeah. call it an easement, but I could say easement or restriction or similarly enforceable restriction. Uh, okay, I, I, I think it's a restriction enforceable by third party. That's if I were to draft the, the document, it would say easement and restriction. Okay. Uh, that's so what, what, I, <laughs> what I heard you say is that number three should be then an enforceable easement, conservation easement, or similarly enforceable restriction be granted. Yes. Okay, close yeah, enough. Right. Yep. Okay. Close enough. Good. You accept that? So that's the end of my motion. <laughs> okay. Could I? Yes. There, we have nine. I've got nine. Okay. Just checking. Um, there was one point here, um, I think it was number three, yep. uh, providing that, that one single family residence on each lot. I would expand that a little to say one single family residence and related accessory structures. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Whatever it really is. normally goes with a single family residence. Yes. Like a shed. <laughs> and that was number three. Okay. okay. Do I take a motion that the applicant wanted to make? Well, we need a second, though. Oh, I'll second it. I'll second. Okay. Uh, I do have a clarification of one of your comments, either now or later. Go ahead. I don't know. Well, yeah. makes sense. I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, the reference to the uh, driveway being completed and tested, notwithstanding asphalting. Um, before a building permit is issued, we'd like to be able to change that to an occupancy permit, uh, primarily because you're looking at some fairly heavy excavation equipment going up that road in order to be able to dig the foundation. And toward that, uh, that end, if we inspect yeah. something. I think that's fair. I accept I the amendment. I accept it. it. That seems very fair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none. Wait, excuse me. There was, I, I didn't get this comment, but there was some comment about uh, the private access way not being built in the building envelope. Private access way has to go through the building envelope in order to be able to no, get to the house. No, it doesn't. Your, your, your building envelope can be next to your private access way. Yes. Well, maybe I misunderstood that it's, as far as the comment is concerned. I just want to make sure that we can build the private access way with no issue pursuant to the restrictions. You could still build whatever you're showing. Great. Okay. No further discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. This motion has passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who seconded um, No, Lane made the motion and um, Carol Ann seconded it. Okay, thank you. That was messy. item on our agenda? I, item number six. One way or the other. Thank Robinson you. Woods II Resource Protection Permit. Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to construct trail improvements on Robinson Woods II and a lot located at the end of Cantor Lane under section 19-8-3 of the Resource Protection Permit Completeness. The application will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will be providing an overview, followed by a presentation by the applicant, followed by public comment on the completion of the application, and then the board will determine if the application is complete. 
Marina, you set for an overview on Robinson. Why not? Chris, you're all I know. Lost your audience. Okay, so uh, Robinson Woods 2 is located in the RA district, but the only areas you're looking at are all in the RP1 wetland district or the RP1 wetland buffer or the RP2 district. Uh, there are some existing trails on the property and the applicant is proposing to make changes to some existing trails and also to put in some new trails. And you're not looking at all of the trails, you're only looking at the portions where changes or new are happening in wetland areas. So um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Great, and so <clears throat> Chris Franklin, I'm the Executive Director at the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust and um, we're excited to bring this forward. And so let me just, uh, if you want, I can give you a quick uh, bird's eye view of the project, which does have <clears throat> the entirety of uh, the property that uh, we recently acquired, 63 acre parcel. This is Shore Road uh, running by Pond Cove here. Um, there's an existing trail in blue that uh, begins on the Belfield Road access way um, coming down across the property, crossing over a wetland area, uh, open water wetland here going through the woods, going through a stream crossing there, coming back up, coming down, and then uh, existing trail comes through here and then follows out to uh, the Methodist Church parcel on Route 77. So that's the sort of scale and the scope of this project. We're gonna be focusing on uh, the red sections. <clears throat> this section here is a 1,200 foot uh, section within the RP1 wetland setback, which has been chosen because it's an existing pathway which we are planning on improving um, and putting in a new crossing here uh, at the narrowest point available to minimize impact and uh, the egress on this side. Uh, the topography allows us to get away from the wetland quickly and onto high dry ground within a matter of uh, feet. Um, this second aspect of the uh, project entails uh, trails, uh, a new trail, 1400 feet of trail going down what we call this panhandle on the property and then joining here um, along an, a trail easement that's been donated to the land trust by the owners of the property off of Cantor Lane. As you can see the existing trail literally bisects uh, one of their buildable lots um, and so their interest in having the trail connect from the Robinson Woods 2 property was to allow that property, that trail to go along the outer edge um, and we're trying to accommodate that so that the property, uh, the trails will be fully uh, contained upon trails that either owned by the land trust or to which the land trust has been deeded uh, public access rights um, this <clears throat> trail segment uh, in its entirety represents 70% of, um, of, of what's missing in our crosstown trail between Fort Williams and Kettle Cove. It's, uh, it's long been uh, the goal of both the land trust and the town to have uh, a trail connection with deeded public access. That's what we try to provide as part of the Greenbelt trail system and as part of the trail system. So that's the, the basis for this and I'm glad to go through um, and answer questions. Uh, we can look at segments uh, individually. I also am prepared to address the two comments from the engineer's uh, review of our proposal. So I, I guess I'll just look to you for guidance on how you want me to proceed. I was going to ask you to please address the questions from the town engineer. Okay, so the March 13th letter from the uh, town engineer um, addressed the issues of stormwater runoff. Um, and our waiver uh, requesting that uh, because these are earth-based trails um, that we're not uh, proposing any fill, we're not proposing uh, any grading, we're not proposing any culverts. Uh, they, he uh, felt that that was a fair request in that the, uh, it wasn't, we weren't going to be essentially generating lots of stormwater runoff. So, um, 
as well as uh, our request for a waiver for uh, wetland vegetation delineation. We know where that we're within the uh, wetland setback area adjacent to um, open water wetland and trying to minimize our impact there in the vegetation analysis um, wasn't going to uh, it would generally be used to indicate whether or not you were within a wetland area and uh, so the again the impact being small um, they felt that that waiver request was was um, appropriate um, <clears throat> another one uh, re um, referenced the vegetative clearing that we had referenced in our materials that we had sent um, what we said was a map of the vegetative clearing and just to clarify I've been asked to clarify that point and what my answer is that and I'll provide I brought some slides that will show representative um, photographic images of these trail sites all of these trail segments will require limited vegetative treatment but it's mostly going to be you know cutting off limbs of trees as opposed to cutting down trees that for with the exception of this area here the panhandle um, and this segment along the the property line um, the vast majority of the property we have the ability to meander our path uh, through the larger trees uh, the panhandle gives us a 25 foot wide uh, segment in which we can uh, meander back and forth to avoid the largest trees and so we're not anticipating having to cut any trees over eight inches so, you know we're really trying to minimize any vegetative removal uh, just for soil stability and and only as necessary um, the tr and so along this bottom line here for the trail easement we are limited to a 10 foot wide segment so I do want to show you some representative photos uh, that show what that area looks like so you'll have a sense of, of what, what type of vegetation will be clearing so I guess I would start there um, and just to orient you this is uh, looking to the north <clears throat> so heading down and I'll see if I can pull up the map in the background but um, to the right of the image you can see a stone wall that represents the um, the property line and so that from the stone wall out that's probably uh, a little over 10 feet and so looking along the stone wall you have a sense of um, if we're going to do a four foot wide path through here that we're not going to need to remove that tree you might remove some of the upper limbs just so people don't hit their heads on them but you know that's the kind of thing that you will be able to navigate around and that can sit in the middle of a trail and not have to be removed um, I can give you one more uh, representative from that same area this is in the lower segment of, of that um, same area again you have your stone wall running here and you can see that you know you might want to remove one or two of these but in a 10 foot wide segment unless the tri the you know you should be able to sort of squeeze through um, this is uh, an area we'll come back to uh, because this is the uh, corner of the property here on the Cantor Lane parcel where it meets the panhandle from the Robinson Woods in an area that's seasonally wet it's not uh, it's adjacent to an RP2 area it's not classified as RP2 on our wetland delineations but um, is an area that we're likely to do some board walking in because you can see that it's sort of a low area that tends to collect water uh, it's not a large area but uh, you know this is an area but in terms of vegetative removal we're really not uh, too concerned um, I'll show you the existing pathway, which is on the and I apologize if these are hard to see in the light, but um, you 
with a little background there, but you can see that the existing pathway is only a foot wide or so, but this is a fairly mature forest. There are some smaller trees along the side of the, uh, the pathway that if we were to clear this for a four foot wide pathway, um, again, we're sort of meandering uh, through the woods here. So uh, down that center line of the trail, there are no trees because it's an existing pathway. Uh, we're just talking about uh, small trees uh, that are adjacent. And if you have a large tree on one side, uh, you know, that center line of the trail be can become the edge of the trail and you can go three feet the other way. So you have the ability to move. Yes. So, actually, I mean, I'm not a great walker. The only time I've been down in Robinson Wood, it said pointed in all directions and suddenly the signpost gave out and I was lost. I couldn't even find the one on the way back. But that, to me, doesn't particularly look like a walkway. I mean, I can see there's a slight indentation there. And that's basically what you, you define as a walkway, a slight indentation, or you clear a path. Right, so that this is a lightly used existing pathway and what our intentions would be, you know, I'm not sure that the, the, the tread width, you know, we're not going to remove surface, you know, any grasses or anything. We're, I guess my question is how do you know what's a pathway when you're walking it? Well, we, we try to clear a pathway we could walk with your arms outstretched and not run yeah, into branches. Yeah, right. That's what and so, you know, sometimes, that, a lot of times, that's just limbing the trees that are adjacent to you as opposed to removing the trees. You may have said this, but do, are you going to put wood chips down or anything? Nope. No. Okay. No, you know, we're, we're, we're really trying, you know, that these trails drain the best, they uh, operate the best, um, in the actual uh, people walking on these trails compacts the earth enough so that the vegetation doesn't really grow back as much and it, it sort of defines itself as a path corridor. Is it your plan to mark the pathway? Yes. So I would get lost. <laughs> With maps as well, yes. Hey, look, you, you are here, signs. Um, <clears throat> just one, the one area that I haven't uh, illustrated for you, um, is the egress from our, our major crossing, which I do want to show you. And so this is from what we're calling the egress on the south side of our water crossing. Um, as it goes in on your map is that shortest segment, that 250 foot segment that goes from our proposed water crossing to reconnect to the existing trails. Um, and th the area that I uh, indicated was chosen in part because the topography uh, slopes uh, quickly uh, up from the edge of the wetland. And you know, in a matter of feet, you're, uh, you know, you, if you walk, 20 feet from the water's edge, you're already probably eight or nine feet above the water surface. And as you get 50 or 100 feet away from the water body, you're pro gained probably close to 40 feet in elevation. So we're tr trying to, you know, recognizing that we're crossing a sensitive water body, we're trying to get away from it and onto high ground as quickly as possible. Um, so the, the, <clears throat> the elements are really the improvement of 1,200 feet of trail the construction of uh, 250 feet of trail, more or less, in this area, and that and new easement area, which is an additional 1,400 feet of trail that will need to be, um, I guess, installed. Uh, there are three structures associated with our uh, application, um, one being at this site, and I'll give you a picture going the other way. And this is uh, from the north side of, of uh, the property looking south. Uh, here about a 50-foot uh, section of shallow water, perhaps uh, a foot deep. Um, we're proposing to use uh, structures such as the town used down at Great Pond, which are extruded aluminum uh, with small uh, feet that sit uh, within the wetland, uh, very sturdy, very um, resilient, 
uh, can be adjusted uh, to maintain uh, being level. Those are four feet wide, um, and we're asking, I believe, for up to 100 feet just to make sure that at any of the wetland edges that we don't just start right at the wetland edge, but we're going to start inland a bit to make sure that we're not uh, impacting the edges of this wetland area at all. Um, that would be one of the structures. The other structure, um, this is a small stream crossing that's existing that we would be uh, replacing in an area. Um, but uh, give you a better sense of, so this is the existing crossing here as the trail. And actually, uh, it's only about 35 feet away that uh, to maintain the trail within the property owned by the land trust, we're proposing essentially uh, a, a better structure, one also of the same materials that we would use for our larger crossing, but to uh, just make sure that we went from bank to bank without impacting the stream bed at all. Um, this is a seasonal stream, uh, flows mostly year round. Uh, in runoff areas, it gets somewhat larger, but doesn't ever go over its banks. And so we would, you know, we're just going to make sure that we give it enough buffer. Um, and just, you know, you can see something like this is kind of put together with plywood and two by fours uh, because we're, our interest is minimizing impact and ensuring safe public access. We're going to do something a bit more substantial, but uh, we think that's better for the resource as well. Um, so put on it or what? Pardon me? Put on it or I don't think so. Uh, in this area for the short one, for the larger one, we may look at those options in terms of whether it's waist high or not. Um, the, the one down at Great Pond does not have uh, railings. Um, this is an area that may be used by uh, bikers and, uh, you know, it's a somewhat of a hazard. It does have the, the posts and any of the posts that you have are going to have at least temporarily, the caps on them, and uh, so. We know how to keep the caps on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll take note. Um, and then the final area is that photo I had shown you in the property corner where there's that sort of swale that gets uh, seasonally wet and we really want to uh, just sort of take precautions there. And I think in the application we showed you, illustrated the type of bog bridging that we've used at other properties to good effect. Uh, in terms of the four inch thick uh, hemlock boards and those of uh, the ones that Dyer Hutchison have been there um, I'd say six or seven years and they still have uh, plenty of life in them. So. Sure. Do you bring your materials and equipment to do this construction in by hand or do you have a vehicle you can get in there? Get well, we, we have the ability to uh, to use, these are all uh, paths that are uh, restricted against motorized use unless they're for stewardship activities. So we do have the ability to bring in uh, a gator or an ATV type. Uh, we, we'd rather not, we, we do get every year um, in May, the eighth graders come out and it, you'd be amazed how much stuff 125 eighth graders can move over a three day period. All that bog bridging that we've done at Robinson Woods and at Dyer Hutchison was done by the eighth graders and they carried that in from the vehicles. So, you know, it, right. Um, the, this area in particular can be easy, easily accessed from another trail off the end of Beach Bluff Terrace. So we, we could get permission from the landowner to do that. Um, and that would be a, a matter of probably 200 yards. Uh, are you going to remove? Are you going to remove the uh, old trails and uh, crossings? It is the, as they're not on our property. Uh, <laughs> um, we would not, you know, it when we came when we made these agreements with the landowners. Um, it was their hope that our trails would replace theirs, and so our assumption is that once ours are in place, that they will either enable us to or uh, by themselves. I, we would offer to take them out. And there's no, there's no need for duplication, especially in this area where they're 30 feet apart. Did you address in the, um, engineer's, the engineer's letter um, number five? He was looking for an uh, applicant should clarify the item about attachment K. Uh, I can't yes, you, I'm sorry. Just 
And that's where we were uh, suggesting minor modifications of the existing pathway. I, I think it was because I could not find an attachment K. But there was not one. Okay, so. So, um, let me just, I believe it is. You took care of it verbally instead. Yes. Was that the vegetation? Yes. So I offered the photographs instead, and I'm glad to, and they're on this computer now, but um, the map would have shown, would essentially have to show that throughout that entire segment of the three trails, there would be some limited vegetative removal, but it's our intent and to our best interest to do as little as possible. Okay. <laughs> Anyone have any comments, any questions? I think we're looking at completeness for tonight. Yes, that is right. Um, I do need a public comment. Um, I would just say um, there is no one here. So we will not be taking any public comment. Okay. So, um, ready? Yes, a motion, please. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a resource protection permit to construct wetland water crossings and install and improve trails located in RP1, RP1 buffer, and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods 2 Shore Road and at the end of Morgan Lane be deemed complete. Second. Second. Lane. Any discussion on the motion? I, w I would just add that portions of the trail are within the RP1 buffer and portions are adjacent to RP2, that they're not, uh, as submitted, not within RP2. We don't, we're not reviewing those portions. Okay. Okay. Um, hearing no further discussion, um, all those in favor? Completeness. And opposed? And that is also passed unanimously. Um, sidewalk? Mm -hmm. Should we set a date for a sidewalk? Oh, this could be an adventure. Should we take it? It's beautiful. It? I'd be glad to take it. I'd be, you know, if you, I don't know if you all have to go together, but I'd be more than happy to take any of you individually out there or take the chair out or... <laughs> With respect to the applicant, and <laughs> you can't be taking individual board members out there. Okay. Would anyone like to take a sidewalk? Would anyone like to... I'm seeing skepticism. <laughs> no sidewalk then? Okay. Yeah, I would love to see it at some point as a, as a walker, but I, the scope of the work seems modest enough, so I don't feel the need. You want to agree with that comment? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Then, um, should we schedule a public hearing on this item for April 22nd? I believe that would be the date. So we'll go ahead and, uh, yeah. Since you're at this point, I just wanted to, the Conservation Commission will also be providing comments. Their last meeting went till 11 p.m. and they hadn't gotten to this yet, so it was a very, very brief discussion about looked complete, but they will be attempting to provide you comments before April 22nd, so that was my first thing. My second thing was I would like to make a comment about um, the bog bridges and what effort you would be making to make there a ramp to go up to them so mm -hmm. there's no step. Because when we're putting these in, I know that's one of the challenges that the town has when we create the boardwalks is to not create more of an impediment for handicap accessibility. Fair enough. Yeah. If you could get a wheelchair down that sort of trailway. I've uh, spoken with Alpha One in the past and there, while the trail guidelines that are out there right now for handicap accessibility do provide an exemption if you've got physical limitations on the site. The comment that Alpha One made was don't, don't underestimate the ability of people to be able to negotiate your trails and that we shouldn't be making them more um, inaccessible than they already are. Yeah. But this is more accessible, not less. Well, no, but I mean if someone can get out there in some manner and then they hit a boardwalk, and I'm not talking about your mm -hmm. boardwalk because we have the same challenges. You don't want there to be a step. Oh, I see. Okay, so we'll have a uh, 
public hearing on this on April 22nd. Great, okay. thank you. Matt, do you have a motion on this? Yeah, you have to table it. Oh. And I didn't do the motion, so someone's going to have to wing it. Does somebody like to wing the motion that we set a public hearing on this? You can take the motion that you made for completeness and just amend the end of it to say that tabled to the April 22nd meeting at which time a public Go hearing ahead. will be held. Oh, you get it written down. Oh, okay. ah, be it ordered that based on the plans materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for resource protection permit to construct wetland slash water crossings and install slash improve trails located in RP1, RP1 buffer, and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods 2 Shore Road and at the end of Morgan Lane be tabled until the April planning board meeting at which time a public hearing will be held. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. And um, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you. Yes. I'll, I'll look for your signs so I don't get lost. <laughs> This is a request when scheduling that um, we have a board meeting next door the same weekend, so we can sort of get the beginning and the end, but I'm not going to hold it. It's not talking about it. Because the item has been tabled, it's now old business, so you would be one of the first items they take up. Okay. You would be the first item, okay. unless a de minimis change came in. So. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the subdivision over ordinance overhaul. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council has referred to the planning board a request to overhaul the subdivision ordinance as recommended in the comprehensive plan, section 16-3-6C, amendments to the subdivision ordinance public hearing. Um, so be addressed in the following manner. Town plan will provide a summary followed by a public hearing and then the board will discuss the item followed by a vote. I am very pleased to present for your consideration hopefully the last draft that the planning board will be reviewing on the subdivision ordinance. And I have been asked to just again review the changes. Uh, first of all, normally when we do a sub when we do an ordinance amendment, we um, have one version and we strike through the things that we're deleting and we add in the things with an underline that we're adding. But because this was an overhaul of the entire ordinance and the planning board asked for clarity when existing language was just moved to another section, the, the red line version doesn't show a, an exact representation of how things have been changed. Because when something was moved from one section to another, it wasn't shown as underlined and struck through. For that reason, I would recommend that the, the planning board, if you're willing to move this forward, recommend to the council that this replace the existing subdivision ordinance. And that the red line version you have is really more of a reference to illustrate the changes you've made. Uh, with that said, the main changes that you've made, the motivations for doing this, and I should point out that apparently we haven't done anything with this, anything major since the 60s. So it's, it's a very dated ordinance except for some um, minor updates to the performance guarantee section and to the road construction standards. Um, there's been very little changes to this ordinance for a long time. So the first major change was to bring it into compliance with state subdivision law. The law changed several years ago and it eliminated the opportunity for municipalities to have a definition of subdivision that was different from the state. So we made the definition the same definition that the state statute requires. The other thing we did is we did a better job of taking the state subdivision standards of review and merging them with the town standards of review so you now have one section of standards instead of two different sections in two different places. Um, I think the whole overall ordinance has been better organized. There's a lot more headings. Uh, sections that say the same things are now repeated verbatim. Um, there are places where things have been pulled out such as the public noticing and the review escrow account sections and those are 
used in other ordinances and they've been put near the top. So, uh, and then there's been changes to the performance guarantee section in the post approval to reflect what has exact, what is actually the current practice of the town. And then uh, there have been updates to the, the, spe the specifications for road construction. I would say that they're not, they're not material updates. They're, you know, pavement widths have adjusted over time and those are the types of changes. Pavement um, depth, excuse me, not pavement width. And then the other potentially substantive change is the major subdivision uh, review submission list. The major subdivisions have a two-step approval process, preliminary approval and then final approval. That implies that the planning board oh, approves a concept and then you approve the final plans. But your current submission list requires very detailed submissions as part of preliminary approval. And what this does is allow applicants to provide more conceptual information. And then after they've gotten approval from the planning board for that conceptual plan, they then spend the money to do all the final design and the board can review the final plan. And that has the benefit of allowing I think the planning board a little bit more influence in getting those plans changed at the preliminary plan level and the applicant can spend less money making revisions. So uh, what you have in front of you is a brand new ordinance. Um, I think almost all the formatting has been taken care of. I did find one place where stormwater in the, in the uh, standard section was underlined and that needs to be changed and I found one other little formatting error but other than that I think it, it reflects what you've been talking about unless you have found other mistakes. And your action tonight would be to hold a public hearing to hear all the public comment uh, and then you could either refer this back to a workshop for more work or you could choose to forward this to the council for consideration. I would open up the public hearing and I see no one for the record in the audience. So now I will close the public hearing and ask the board for any comments, questions about the subject put in? Anyone? Elaine. Just have um, just in terms of formatting issues, in my copy in appendix A and B there is some language in bold face type. Quite a bit of it. Is that I assume that has to do with times when revisions have been made, so somehow that all needs to be in the same typeface. Um, bold type in the appendices? Mm -hmm. Appendix A and Appendix B. Right, so for example, on page 38, under number two, there's a lot of words in bold type. That's deliberate, because that is our way of telling people that the stuff in bold type needs to be on plans, as opposed to oh, submitted as information. Right. Okay, you're right forgot about that. But it was a good idea when it was suggested. <laughs> Not by Eileen. No. Okay, got it. Anyone else? Any comments? Any changes? Amendments? No, I'd just like to thank Maureen on the public tape for an incredible amount of work that it took to update this ordinance and do it in a way that is respectful of the state ordinance, makes things clear, and changes only what's necessary to accomplish that. I think it, she did a really good job and helped us all get through it. Yes. yes, thank you. Then, would anyone like to make a motion? Henry, you haven't made one tonight. Would you just make a motion? Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't. But do you have the, I don't have the uh, motion in front of you. We're going to get you in two minutes. Yeah. Be it ordered that, based on the new ordinance presented, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board recommends that the new subdivision ordinance be adopted as a replacement of the subdivision ordinance. Anyone like to? That is it. Anyone like to second that? Peter, any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, excuse me. Yes. The motion. Talk about. We are replacing the subdivision regulation, I believe. The last word of that motion is oh. not the, the, the document we're replacing. All I see what you're saying. Yes. It was called the subdivision regulation. So, so. it's a replacement to the subdivision regulation? Gotcha. Is that a friendly amendment? Mr. Steinberg? Yes, I accept the friendly amendment. Okay. 
Now, all those in favor? And opposed? We didn't have a second to put up for We did. Peter did. We did. Oh, Peter did. And then that passes unanimously. Okay. Next item is adjournment. And um, once again, would anyone like to make a motion for adjournment? Make a motion, we adjourn. Second. Lane, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? And right, Peter. And we are oh, I'm sorry. adjourned. Thank you.